Fishermen in Fukushima have agreed to a plan to reduce the buildup of contaminated water at the crippled plant. The government and Tokyo Electric Power Company officials say they'll pump out groundwater before it becomes contaminated and release it into the ocean. NHK World's Takafumi Terui has more. Fishermen from a coastal community in Iwaki brought in their first catch of sandlands this season. It's a part of the trial fishing that had started along the coast of Fukushima Prefecture. They have resumed selling fish that's been confirmed safe after testing. Fishermen were concerned the groundwater release plan may again cast doubt on their catch, but they felt they had no choice. We didn't want the plan to go ahead, but we can't just be thinking about ourselves. We understand the measure is necessary for the decommissioning to proceed. TEPCO has started work on decommissioning the damaged reactors, but the buildup of contaminated water is hindering progress. Officials say 400 tons of groundwater flows into the reactor buildings every day. The groundwater mixes with cooling water for the reactors and gets contaminated. The plan is to pump out the groundwater before it reaches the building, store it in a tank to check the radiation level, and release it into the ocean. TEPCO officials say they have set the standard for release at more than 10 times lower than the government standard. They say the measure will cut down the daily buildup of contaminated water by 100 tons. Members of fishing associations in Fukushima gave their approval of the plan on Tuesday. They asked government and TEPCO officials to make sure the water released is not contaminated. Not all of us were for the plan. We hope the government and TEPCO will not undermine our trust because we made a very difficult decision. We believe tackling the problem of contaminated water and proceeding with the decommissioning are important for reconstruction in Fukushima. Fukushima fishermen are asking for an independent third party to monitor the implementation of the plan and for information to be shared with the public to ensure the credibility of the Now, TEPCO engineers have restarted a key water treatment system at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. The system malfunctioned due to a series of problems. Two out of three lines in the Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS, were suspended on Monday after workers found water leaking from a storage tank. The workers changed the packing on a side hatch of the tank. They were able to stop the leakage and resumed operation on Tuesday afternoon. A week ago, workers found one of the lines was performing poorly, so they halted the entire system. The ALPS system is said to be capable of removing almost all radioactive substances from wastewater. TEPCO officials hope to put ALPS into full operation as early as uh, next Japan's month. top executives from the nuclear industry are being brought together to tackle the crisis at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company are drawing on the managerial expertise at the country's major manufacturers to help oversee the decommissioning of the crippled reactors. The new body will have one executive each from Hitachi GE Nuclear Energy, Toshiba and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. They'll serve as senior officers. That's they'll serve as senior officers. In the past, these firms have helped TEPCO with separate tasks such as removing spent fuel and developing robots to probe highly radioactive areas. From next month, the executives will be involved in the entire decommissioning process. They'll provide their know-how to help solve problems, including recurrent linkage of polluted water. TEPCO and government officials want to start removing melted fuel from the damaged reactors in about six years. 
The new body is under strong public pressure to ensure the decommissioning process proceeds smoothly. The Prime Minister says he and his countrymen learned a lot from the accident in Fukushima, and Shinzo Abe says he's determined to play a key role in promoting nuclear security. Abe made the comments at the Nuclear Security Summit. He said members of his administration will work to advance nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament around the world. And he said they'll promote the abolishment of nuclear weapons. Abe said the measures are consistent with his policy of proactive pacifism and will contribute to world peace and stability. Abe noted that Japan is the only country to experience a nuclear attack. He said the Japanese support the peaceful use of nuclear energy. He said because of the Fukushima accident, Japan has a responsibility to take the lead in ensuring nuclear security. As an example, Abe said Japan will hand over a stockpile of highly enriched uranium and plutonium to the United States. The Japanese purchased the material decades ago for research purposes. Abe said Japan will also accept a mission from the International Atomic Energy Agency. The aim is to strengthen safeguards for nuclear materials. Scientists and government officials from around the world have gathered in a city south of Tokyo to talk about the state of the planet. They're attending the latest session of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. It's the first time Japan has played host. Participants are discussing how people can better prepare for extreme weather and other challenges. NHK World's Kurando Tago reports. About 500 scientists and government representatives from more than 100 countries have come together to talk about a problem many feel is only getting worse. They're going over the latest report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This report would equip not only national and sub-national governments with an understanding of how and in what manner to adapt to the impacts of climate change, but also make it possible to go right down to the local level in providing a basis for decisions and initiatives on adaptation. Scientists see the impact of climate change everywhere. From record rainfall and flooding in Britain, to heavy snow and bitter cold in North America, to drought in Africa. These types of extreme weather events used to occur once every several decades. They are now happening with greater frequency. Participants at the IPCC meeting are discussing the second of a three-part report on climate change. It deals with how humans will need to adapt. The IPCC released the first part last September. It's a bleak assessment of what will happen if nations don't reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The report says the average temperature could increase by at most 4.8 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and ocean levels could rise by a maximum of 82 centimeters. An expert from Tohoku University says 91 percent of beaches in Japan could disappear. IPCC researchers say it's extremely likely that human activity caused global warming since 1950. Government leaders and officials have struggled to craft an agreement to tackle the problem. They haven't come up with a framework to replace the Kyoto Protocol, which set emissions targets. IPCC participants have watched it all unfold. The panel does not make direct recommendations, but some would say its forecasts should be enough to spur action. The new report will show us the precise picture of the Earth's condition based on in-depth scientific research. We should be brave enough to take another step in making policy changes in order to overcome the crisis of climate change. Participants will meet all this week to talk about the IPCC findings. They'll gather in Berlin next month to discuss the third and final part of the panel's report. That document will offer ideas for how humans can counter the impact 
of climate change. Dangers from climate change aren't down the road. They're already here, and they're fueling a global food crisis. This week, more than 60 scientists from around the world are meeting in Japan to finish writing a comprehensive report on the impact and danger of climate change and global warming. That report, which is being written at a meeting of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, seeks to tell global leaders just how bad the climate change problem is right now. And it turns out it's very bad. While the report hasn't been released yet, leaked drafts have been, and they're painting a pretty frightening and very disturbing picture. According to the leaked drafts, the major risks and effects of climate change and global warming are far more immediate than was first thought. And those effects go beyond melting ice, rising temperatures, and threatened species of animals and plants. Right now, climate change is driving everything from droughts and flooding to war, disease, and hunger. In fact, global climate change-driven food problems are behind most of the upheavals in the Middle East, from Egypt all the way to Syria. And as climate change continues to worsen, those food problems and conflicts will become more widespread and will extend well beyond the Middle East. That, according to the leaks we're hearing from the IPCC meeting this week in Japan, should cause the entire world to rethink how we produce our food. Right now, much of America's and the world's food is produced by giant agribusiness companies. Corporations like Cargill, ConAgra, Kraft, and PepsiCo dominate global food supply distribution uh, using large-scale homogenous single product operations. And they're getting filthy rich in the process. The Big Ten food and beverage companies together make over a billion dollars a day. But as you can imagine, with just a few massive agribiz corporations controlling food distribution for nearly the entire planet, the process is extremely inefficient, unsustainable, and most importantly, fragile. That's why there are 842 million people right now struggling with hunger worldwide. In the face of global climate change and global food crises, common sense, and now apparently the IPC, both tell us that in order to build a more resilient food system and future, we must decentralize global agriculture break up the big agribusiness giants and move toward local agricultural systems. Cities like Detroit have already realized that. Yes, the same city whose economy is in pieces and where people are struggling to make ends meet, it turned into one of the biggest success stories in local agriculture and community gardening. According to the USDA, nearly 15 percent of the world's food is now grown in urban areas like Detroit. City goers are using backyards, rooftops, and vacant lots and parks to grow local. Entire blocks of run-down and abandoned homes have been knocked down and turned into community gardens. In fact, there are now over 300 community gardens across Detroit, and that number is climbing by the day. And city schools are getting in on the urban farming action, too. 18 schools in Detroit have built school gardens. In the face of economic despair, Detroiters have found a way to keep food local, to keep money in the local economy, and to remove the influences of giant agribiz corporations. And, perhaps most importantly, they're being environmentally friendly, too. Our current food system, driven by giant agribiz corporations, is incredibly destructive to our environment. It relies on toxic fertilizers and pesticides, not to mention all the fossil fuels used to grow, fertilize, and transport the food. But local and organic agriculture doesn't rely on dangerous pesticides and herbicides, and it does sequester carbon in the soil rather than releasing it into our atmosphere. And local organic agriculture produces higher yields and higher quality food, too, which simply, ca simply can't be matched by giant agribiz corporations. Climate change is making it abundantly clear that we need to rethink and reinvent our global food systems. The age of a few giant agribiz corporations controlling most of the world's food supply should come to an end. Here in America, we can use the Sherman Act to break up giant agribiz corporations and the giant banks whose speculation is constantly increasing food prices. A few companies should not hold the fate of billions of people in their hands. While we're doing that, we need to encourage more local agriculture across America and around the globe. Put control over food production and distribution back in the hands of the people. Every home in America could have a garden so that entire neighborhoods and communities be can become both more self-sustainable and perhaps more importantly, more resilient. 
It's time to break the corporate stranglehold on our food system. And in the process, we can help combat global warming.